Down the long path of history, trampling across centuries and continents in the graves of kings and the necks of dictators, seeking always a way of life where the people have their freedom, believing, praying, fighting, dying, we came this way. <laughs> NBC University of the Air, a public service feature of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations, presents We Came This Way, a new historical series for our listeners at home and overseas. With Clifton Utley as narrator, we present Chapter 7, the story of Kashut, the struggle for independence in We Came This Way. The Court of Vienna, 1832. A place of waxed ballrooms, flirtatious eyes, handsomely uniformed officers guiding beautiful women across the dance floor. The Court of Vienna, a place also of intrigue, the power machine of imperialism, where the clinking of two wine glasses could signify the death of a nation. Your Highness, as long as we continue to pit the races of Hungary against each other. Yes, yes, as we have done in the past. We do not stand in any immediate danger of Hungary ever becoming united strongly enough to demand its independence outright. Uh, no more politics, Prince Metternich, please. It is my birthday. Have some consideration. Uh, let us finish our wine and join the dancers. And while the Emperor and Prince Metternich laughed gaily with powdered ladies of the court, while feet were gliding gracefully across the checkered dance floor. There was no dancing in the homes of Hungary. There was no music, no laughter, no gaiety. Instead, there were tears, and there were wringing hands and the all-too-familiar sound of a hearse passing through the cobbled streets, carrying away another citizen of Hungary. Cholera had struck deep into the heart of a nation. There was hardly a family that had not been affected. Hardly a citizen who did not know at first hand the ravages of the dread disease. It's not an epidemic. It's not. Uh, the fine nobility and their fine airs telling us it's the water we drink. I can tell you where it started and who's behind it. They are. They've poisoned our drinking water so they can kill us all. Yes. Many good people believed that. Many believed it so strongly that they acted upon it. There were those who crept through the stillness of the night, hiding in the darkness leaning against the gray walls of an alley, waiting and listening until the early hours of the morning, listening for the footfalls of their victim. And as the footsteps came nearer, slowly they would detach themselves from the protecting darkness. Sometimes a moonbeam would flash silver against the blade of the dagger. <coughs> Quickly the figure would disappear, leaving the stricken noble lying where he fell, drowning in his own blood, guilty only of being born of noble birth. Yes, this while the Emperor of Austria and Prince Metternich laughed gaily with the powdered ladies of their court, while feet were gliding gracefully across the checkered dance floor. There was only one man whom the people trusted completely, one man to whom they listened and in whom they believed. The cholera is only a disease, believe me. Killing the nobles of Hungary will not help your sick children. Fight it by boiling your drinking water, by cleaning the places where you live and sleep. Believe me, citizens, I speak the truth. A lawyer by profession, he came from an honorable family that had long ago been impoverished. A man of good sense and good reputation. His name was... Koshut, I want to talk with you. Yes, Baron Metanium. Lyers Koshut, we of the nobility owe you a debt of gratitude. If you hadn't spoken to the peasants and the workmen during the most terrible epidemic and shown them that... It is all a thing of the past, Baron. <clears throat> there is an opening for you in the parliamentary committee. The diet. You will not have a vote, Koshut, you understand? But you may sit in and transcribe the notes on the parliamentary proceedings. Do you accept? It would be possible for me to refuse you, Baron. But I cannot refuse Hungary. It wasn't long at all before the court of Vienna began to take more than just a casual interest in the pamphlets which he was editing. 
Journal of Information. Uh, what sort of information? This journal carries a complete transcript of all questions and speeches made at the Diet meeting, Sam. And you say Metternich, these are being distributed throughout Hungary? Exactly, Your Highness. Oh. <laughs> I can see that these are indeed more than just transcripts. They have been nicely editorialized so that they all point towards one thing, the independence of Hungary. Uh, who is the editor, did you say? Lajos Kosciut. Oh, yes, yes. Sort of a public hero, isn't he? Well, we have means of dealing with situations of this nature. Inform the good Kosciut of the old law, which is still in existence, forbidding the publication of all political matters. Let us hope he violates the order, for then we can throw him in jail for treason. <laughs> Give up the journal? I should say not, Baron. It's becoming one of the strongest weapons in our hands. But there's the law, Koshut. The law states that no political matter may be printed, right? Exactly. But the law says nothing about distributing journals that are written out by hand. It will be necessary to keep a large staff of scribes busy, but the journal will be distributed, Baron. The Emperor of Austria now dispensed with all subtlety. Prince Metternich composed the order. The Emperor signed it blotted it carefully, and gave it to his chief of police. This order charged you to arrest Lajos Korshut for the crime of treason. The arrest which followed was a simple technicality performed by the servants of the court with commendable efficiency. There was the usual pounding on the door, the all-too-familiar sight of the official uniforms. The trip by carriage through the streets of Budapest... And finally, confinement in jail. Koshut had been withdrawn from circulation. The deed had been accomplished. There was only a trial yet to go through. Now look, Jailer, I've been awaiting trial for eight solid months. Do you mean to say that... I don't say nothing. You're in jail. You're charged with treason. We'll get to you as soon as we're able. As soon as we're able turned out to be exactly one year later. There he stands now. Lajos Koshut. You can always pick him out of a crowd. He's the handsome man with the mustache. The calm one. The one on whose face you'll never find a trace of emotion. Do you see that man standing next to him, the old man? His name is Baron Veselini. His crime, also treason. They're going to sentence him to two years in jail. His title carries a little weight. The Baron will spend one of those years in a dungeon. And then he'll be released and set free. You see... In that one year, Baron Vesseligny is going to become blind. The magistrate is ready to pronounce sentence on Kosciut. For the crime of high treason against the Emperor of Austria, we find you guilty as charged and sentence you to four years' imprisonment. <laughs> Now they're taking Kosciut down the long corridor to his cell. There is still no trace of feeling or emotion on his face. He is still the tall, calm, quiet man, accepting his punishment stoically. The Emperor of Austria was satisfied. Prince Metternich gleefully rubbed his hands, considering the case history of one Lajos Kosciut complete. And yet, both of these men had overlooked one small item. They had overlooked the people of Hungary, the devotion which any people will have for a leader who will stand up and fight for their rights. They had forgotten that the arrest only served to make Kosciut a martyr for the cause of independence, that now he was a name and a man never to be forgotten. I propose that since this is the first session of the new Diet Committee, we take up as our first matter of consideration the scandalous and unjust arrest and sentence imposed upon our countryman, Lajos Kosciut. It took a few months, but public opinion was so strong. The fight of Baron Veselini is so complete that the court of Vienna had to concede. Lajos Kosciut, after three years of confinement, once more stepped into the streets of Budapest, a free man. Two people were waiting for him. He's coming now, Baron. What does he look like? Be my eyes, Teresa, my child. Uh, describe him to me. He's changed. 
much, much changed. He's pale. His eyes are glassy. His, his face pallid. He's... Go on. Go on, Giles. Go on. Wait. He must have a terrible disease. It shows on his body. Oh, shh. He's coming this way. Hello, Baron. Co shoot. Fresh air. Sun. I am Teresa Vasilini. Oh, so young. So pretty. She sent you all those books, Lajos. All those letters. Shh, Baron, and... please. To you, I owe my sanity, Teresa. I don't know how I shall ever repay you. Time will give you the solution, Kasha. Hungary has not forgotten you either, my friend. You are ill. You have no money. But we've already raised enough subscriptions to send you to a sanitarium. All of you are, are so kind. That it's I... more than kindness. You are an investment. Hungary is investing in you for what you will do for Hungary. Do you see? One year of rest. His marriage to Teresa consummated, the pallor vanishing from his face. His frame again filling out, and Lajos Kosciut was ready to begin Act Two in his struggle for the independence of Hungary. This time, he became the editor of a small newspaper called the Pesti Hillop, a small newspaper of violent words that amassed the astounding circulation of 7,000 subscribers. Yet, the court of Vienna took the matter calmly. There is nothing to fear, Your Highness, nothing yet. Baron Bajani and many other nobles are just as displeased with the papers as we are. Leave it to them, Your Highness. They will take care of caution for us. I don't have to tell you, Kaushut, that I'm very much dissatisfied with the tone of your newspaper. You are doing nothing but angering the court of Vienna. We are fighting for Hungary, Baron Batyanyi, not to satisfy the court. I'm not questioning the sincerity of your motives, Kaushut, only your methods. Prince Metternich has asked me to convey his greetings to you and has asked you to see him at once. I, <clears throat> I'm sorry that you resigned from the newspaper. It really wasn't necessary. It was necessary. Asking me to be conservative, my dear Baron, is asking me to die. I shall go and see your Prince Metternich. Sit down, Kashut. Enjoy a cigarette with me, Anne. May I ask why you sent for me, Prince Metternich? I like you. You are direct, firm, no beating around the bush. You come right to the point. Excellent characteristics, really. I uh, understand that you are no longer connected with the Pesti Hellop. Is that true? Yes, it is. Too bad, too bad. I was going to ask you for permission to start my own newspaper. <laughs> Amusing. After what you did with the Pesti Hellop, of course, I can only say no. You understand that, don't you? But instead, I was... Uh, thinking of offering you a job here in Vienna. You mean, Prince Metternich, you are willing to buy my silence, is that it? You are blunt, aren't you? Well, that's it, isn't it? I'm afraid our interview is over, Kajut. There's nothing further we can discuss. Too bad you are so confused, politically. Thank you, Your Highness. Uh, just let me remind you, the uh, cigarette you smoked was Turkish. A nice, neutral blend? I shall remember it, Your Highness. Koshut realized that he had won the first round. Events began to move swiftly now. Unable to write, Koshut became the voice of Hungary, a soft, calm, forceful orator who traveled throughout the land and made friends wherever he went. So strong was the nation behind him that when, in 1847, this man headed the delegation and went to Vienna, the court was obliged to meet his demands. The first Hungarian ministry was set up. Baron Bacchani placed at the head, and Kossuth made Minister of Finance. It is so unfortunate, Kossuth, that you and I will never be able to agree upon anything. 
I had no idea at the time that your object was to become dictator of Hungary. Those are sharp words, Batyan. You're indulging in sharp actions. I'm referring to these coins right here. With your picture on them and the word independent Hungary. There's a good reason for that. I can see in it nothing but the vain, glorious ambitions of a man... Of a man who... who believes in the ultimate destiny of his country and who will fight for its independence with his last ounce of blood. You don't have to practice your oratory on me. Before I'm accused of anything, I demand the courtesy of an explanation. I have these coins issued for the very purpose of bringing daily to the attention of all patriots what we're striving for. I want them to be ever conscious of this feeling of national pride. Conscious of the fact that they are Hungarians. And why your picture? Why? It may not sound right coming from my lips. But at present, my name is known by everyone in our country. That is why my picture. Don't you see? The coin in my picture. That is a combined spark large enough to start a conflagration that will raise the court of Vienna to the ground. Well, it's done. Finished. But I don't approve... Let us at least know exactly where we stand. The revolution of 1848 swept across France. The monarchies of Europe began to tremble. Every day, new reports came to the ears of Kossuth. Philippe of France has fled. The soldiers refuse to fire on the people. The emperor has granted a constitution to the territories of the empire. All of them? What was that? I said, all the countries? Yes, all of them, except Hungary. <laughs> Members of the assembly, the time has come for action, not words. Let these words of mine now be printed and distributed to every man, woman, and child in Hungary. All those who claim to be Hungarians, let them analyze these words carefully and act upon them. If you have faith and resolution, you have sufficient strength to overthrow the Croatian army. If ever Hungary needed a strong and independent army, the time is now. The decision is up to the people of Hungary. The words of Kosciu took effect. The people came to him from all sides. Mere lads of 14 and 15, the blood of youth still fresh on their faces. Old men of 60, bent by years of tyrannical government, their eyes filled for the first time in their lives with hope. They brought their own weapons, knives, hatchets, scythes, anything at all they could carry, forming an army that was united in the fight for the independence of their country. The end is here, Kashut. We have stuck by you long enough. Now you are entering our country into a siege of war. I and my ministry are resigning. You can carry on the fight alone. <laughs> to see me, Koshut? Yes, Vesselini, I did. I'm afraid our cause is lost. Strange, isn't it? Here I am, president of Hungary, and I have to admit defeat. But why? Why? The Tsar of Russia is going to support Vienna. They already have an army on the march against us. The entire affair is now going into the realms of militarism. I'm no general. I've turned the army over to our General Gogol. It has taken me much time to make this decision. And I could only reach a solution by asking myself again and again, in which way can I serve Hungary the best? I'm... I'm abdicating, my friend. Abdicating? Going into exile. Following, strangely, Prince Metternich's advice of some time back. I'm going to Turkey, the only neutral country at present. I shall continue the fight from there. To win our independence, you must have behind us the understanding, the sympathy, and the support of the world. I shall make our cause known to the world, to the great powers, England and America. Believe me, my friend, my last dying breath will be devoted to that cause. You're a great man, Koshut. Hungary will never forget you. I... I have here a declaration to the people of Hungary which I want you to make public to them. Rest assured, Baron. Our fight has only begun. We've lost now, perhaps, but have gained our honor, our spirit. We've gained in our people the desire for independence. 
Goodbye, my friend. I... I shall not see my wife before I leave. Will you say goodbye to her for me? On that same day, having assembled all the nobles and leaders of Hungary, Baron Veseligny gave them the declaration of President Lajos Kossuth. Gentlemen, I shall give you the words of our president. Forced into exile through the unhappy turn of events, I want the nation to listen to me. Do not listen to delusive and reckless appeals. Wait until I call upon you. I shall not carelessly sacrifice any of your blood. Our country will yet be free. Our country will yet be an independent Hungary. If you love your country, if you have faith in its future, impress these words well upon your memory. If you do no more than make those around you understand the situation and our prospects, you will have done a good service to your country. And in the privacy of her small room, Teresa Koschut, with tearful eyes, reads a letter from her exiled husband. My dear Teresa, my eyes can even now see nothing but the grief and sorrow which must have overwhelmed you in the moment of parting. Tears fill my eyes when I think of it. But console yourself, dear angel. Console yourself by anticipating the joy of our meeting again. It is impossible that there should not be in store for us what alone our souls long for, a rest in the evening of our lives. On the 17th of October, 1851, a Mr. Tochman appeared in the editorial rooms of the New York Herald in New York City. Uh, gentlemen, I have here a series of papers which... And as Mr. Tochman fumbled into the inner recesses of his briefcase, he emerged with a handful of papers that bore the official seal of the President of Hungary. In the month of February last, I was sent this proclamation by Leos Kossuth, addressed to the people of the United States. With this, the good Mr. Tochman oratorically paused and pointed to the manuscript in his hands. At the time this valuable document came into my hands, negotiations were pending, uh, having for their object the liberation of Kashut from Turkish custody. Mr. Tochman drew himself up to his full height of five feet four, and then... The time has now arrived. The great Hungarian leader is approaching these shores. There is no longer the necessity to withhold these papers from the public eye of the citizens of this country. And then, plopping the manuscript on their desks, the good Mr. Tochman watched the expressions on their faces as they read through the pages. Two years ago, I, by God's providence, who would only be a humble citizen, held in my hands the destiny of the reigning house of Austria. I did not take advantage of these favorable circumstances though the entire freedom of my dear native land was the only wish of my heart. There was practically no newspaper that did not carry the document in full. Hardly a citizen who did not read it with bated breath. For all knew they were witnessing the dying gasp of European absolutism. Free citizens of America, from your history as from the star of hope in midnight gloom, we drew our confidence and resolution in the doubtful days of our severe trial. Except in the name of my countrymen, the declaration as a tribute of gratitude. And you excellent people, who were worthy to be chosen by the Almighty as an example to show the world how to deserve freedom, how to win it, and how to use it, you will allow that the Hungarians, though weaker and less fortunate than you, through the decaying influences of the old European society, are worthy to be your imitators. When despotism hurled defiance at us and began the bloody war, your inspiring example upheaved the nation as one man, and legions with all the means of war appeared to us from nothing as the tender grass shoots up after spring showers. And then the phrase that did so much to bring the whole affair closer to the heart of every American. Let not one nation partake of another nation's sins. When you see the great law of humanity, the law upon which your national existence rests, the law enacted in the Declaration of Independence, outraged and profaned, 
Will you sit quietly by? Finally, the man himself landed upon the shores of America. There were flags and smiles and there were hands to shake, backs to slap, speeches to be made. But like all men who were great, all men who were ahead of their time, Koshut was gifted with a keen sight that enabled him to picture clearly the dark days yet to come. He could see that it was inevitable for Hungary to be free one day, to be liberated from the Austrian slave chain. And he could see that in reality, the liberation of Hungary would only be a stepping stone toward the liberation of all the world. It was living men he spoke to on that day, but his words were as well addressed to the men yet to come, to their children and their children's children. Words addressed directly to you. Gentlemen, I will again and again repeat these words. I will concentrate all the fire of my sentiment, all the blood of my heart, all the energy of my mind to raise these words high and loud till the almighty echo of public opinion repeating it becomes like the thundering trumpets before the sound of which the Jericho of human oppression falls. Even the grass which will grow out of my grave will cry out to heaven and to man, England and America, do not forget in your proud security those who are oppressed. Do not allow despots to drown liberty in Europe's blood. Save the myriads who else would and will bleed. Be as you always must be, the liberators of the world. Would you like to know more of the life and times of Kashut portrayed in the program you just heard, or other men like Zola, Hugo, and Wilson? A handbook containing life stories of 13 great leaders in the struggle for human liberty has been prepared as an interesting supplement to the broadcast series. To obtain your copy, write for We Came This Way. Address your request to Columbia University Press, Box 30, Station J, New York 27, and enclose 25 cents in coin to cover costs of printing and mailing. Tonight's script was written by Guy DeVry and was directed by Norman Felton. Original music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and conducted by Joseph Galicchio. Members of the cast included William Everett, Paul Hughes, Henry Sachs, Fred Sullivan, Kurt Kupfer, Jane Elliott, Tom Post, and Dick Shankland, with Clifton Utley as narrator. This series is presented each week as a public service feature of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. Roger speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company.